two speeches in 45 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> you are going to talk about two whole speeches in 45 minutes. If you want to just do the yellow bar, you can do that. I guess the yellow stuff really kind of being covered yeah. a lot. Because they did disads and counter plans. I mean, do you? Do you? Yeah, okay. Uh, there, there's a few LSE things I think are helpful, just as general strategic things. Uh, one thing I will say before is that since we don't have time to cover everything in this lecture or certainly even the camp, uh, I want to plug something called the Parley Debate Prep Book that was written last fall. Uh, it's a great resource. A lot of really smart uh, former debaters and coaches contributed sections to it, and uh, even dumb ones like me got to have some input too. So it's a great resource, particularly for developing debaters, uh, and particularly a lot. A lot of people talk about a lot of different LSC strategies that I won't have time to cover in this lecture. So if you want to go more in depth about different ways you can approach the speech, I definitely recommend uh, dropping $10 on that. And the money also goes to doing things like helping uh, new schools go to NPTE for the first time. So it's, you know, it's a pretty good investment. So uh, I will talk about both the LSC and the LOR, though I'll try to focus more on the LOR. Uh, there's a few things that I think are really important though for the LSC that haven't been discussed in other lectures that I do think warrant some consideration. Uh, one of them is that the LOC is the only time the negative gets to read offense against the affirmative plan. So uh, one of the goals of that speech should be to read as much offense as possible. Now what you should not take away from that is Matt Reiser told me not to read defense in the LOC because that is not at all what I'm telling you. Uh, case defense is incredibly important and you absolutely should read it. But uh, as was mentioned briefly in the ML lecture, the MO is also a constructive speech, which means if you need to, you can make case arguments that are defensive at that point. So, you shouldn't feel like you have to only attack the case in the LO, or that you should get too prioritizing of defense. You need to make sure that there is offense in the LOC that you can go for in the MO. So that should be the primary goal of that speech, and you should never deviate away from that. Uh, generally, there's five types of arguments the LOC can read. Uh, they've been discussed at length in other areas, uh, but those are theory, dissats, counterplans, criticism, and case arguments. Now, a good LOC can be composed of one or all of those types of arguments, but there's no perfect formula for what a perfect LOC looks like. It's generally situational, based on what the PMC looks like, based on what your judges like to see, and based on what you as a debater are good at. Now, I think the diversity is really important in the LOC, and when I say diversity, I have a couple layers to that. I think that diversity of arguments within a speech is important. For example, I think if you have a chance to read a dissad, counterplan, criticism, and case arguments, maybe theory in there, the more different types of arguments that you have uh, present in one speech, the more difficult it is for the MG to just make the debate about one single issue. If you have one dissad and one counterplan that are very similar to one another, like you can kind of answer them with a couple arguments, it makes the MG's job a lot easier. But if you have a diverse strategy, a lot of different types of arguments, it makes it much more difficult for the MG to just focus on one or two major themes in the debate, and it makes it so they have to have much more flexibility in answering these positions. When I say diversity, I also mean diversity in the types of LFCs that you read. Some teams, I think, get too locked into doing one type of thing on the negative frequently. Uh, some teams are just K-hacks, right, and they just read one or two criticisms constantly, which makes them incredibly predictable. If you know that the team is just going to say cap is bad every single round, I don't know why you wouldn't just spend a ton of time during prep blocking out answers to that. On the other hand, I think the best teams historically have been teams that are able to approach the resolution from a variety of different perspectives. They can beat you on a politics to set, they can beat you on a criticism, they can savage you going for theory, and the LSC is where you can develop that diversity. Uh, the flip side of that is that it's sometimes it's good to know what you're best at and not deviate away from that too much. Uh, sometimes if you're in a situation where you're going against a team that is just better than you, uh, you just don't think you can beat them on your own merits, uh, it's helpful to know what you're best at that you can fall back on. My senior year, I read hedge and politics as much as humanly possible. That being said, occasionally we'd throw in something like reproductive futurism just because they'd never see that coming, right? But know what you're good at and don't be afraid to default to it in some circumstances, but certainly try to have a diverse LOC strategy both within the speech and in terms of different speeches that you give. Uh, I also think that the conversation about how to select an LOC strategy is really important. Uh, when deciding whether or not you want to prep a position, I think you should always ask yourself, how can the MO go for this argument and win? How can this argument help us win this debate? Uh, even if you have a great disadvantage that you think would work particularly well for a topic, uh, if it doesn't jive with the rest of your strategy, it may not be strategic to read it. 
It doesn't make a lot of sense to read one disad that doesn't seem to go with any of the other arguments you make. Even if that's a really good disad, if it doesn't fit the overall strategy that you think is the most strategic to helping you win the round, sometimes it's not the right decision. So always be asking yourself not what will make this LOC sound, you know, the best coming out of your mouth when it's red, but what will make the MO and the LOR sound the best. That should be the long-term thinking that goes into the strategy selection. We've talked about conditionality a little bit, and I think it warrants some mention here, because the decision as to whether or not you're conditional normally starts in the LOC. Uh, conditional LOC strategies can be strategic because they give you a wider diversity of strategic options. For example, if you read a politics disad, you could read a Supreme Court counterplan and, say, a 50 states counterplan with that. Then you could see which counterplan the MG answers better, and then kick that counterplan. Uh, the disad would probably work for both of them, so if they have great answers to 50 states but trash answers to Supreme Court, kick 50 states, go for Supreme Court. Gives you flexibility. Uh, on the other hand, it often allows you to read a critique without making that a one-off strategy, right? Some teams just want to read a criticism for eight minutes, that's fine. Other teams want to read a criticism, but also give them the option to go for a disad and counterplan. And a conditionality lets you do that. Uh, it also lets you sometimes kick a counterplan that you had every intention of going for if maybe the other team just had great answers. Say you have two disads and a counterplan, and you have every intention of just picking one of those disads and the counterplan and going for them. Occasionally, the MG maybe will just have fantastic answers to that position, or maybe the affirmative was built in a way that answers that counterplan intuitively. In that case, I think it can be really helpful to kick that counterplan and then just go for disads and case arguments. And you have that option with conditionality. So there are certainly a lot of benefits to it. Uh, the potential downsides, though, include possibly spreading yourself too thin. This is particularly a th thing I think that young LOCs get in the habit of doing. They say, oh, look, we have three, four, five arguments that we think would work great for this topic, so let's read all of them. You read all of these arguments, uh, maybe they don't work coherently, maybe they're all a little bit underdeveloped because you're trying to spread out the opponent without going deep on any of these issues. And it also likely means that you're not interacting with the affirmative that much. So sometimes a conditional strategy, if uh, you know, used irresponsibly, can put you in a disadvantage. Uh, it also means that you potentially have to deal with theory. So if you don't think that the MO is equipped to defend your decision to be conditional, or you just think that there's going to be a bad time trade-off, maybe conditionality isn't the right move, but it generally depends on how comfortable you are with it, uh, how comfortable you think the judge is with it, and whether or not it fits your overall strategy and will help you win the debate. But certainly, the decision to be conditional is one that you should consider when you're determining what your LSC strategy is. Uh, this is certainly a personal suggestion, and uh, as many people have said in their lectures, you can feel free to ignore it, but I think that the best strategies are to either go two off and go really deep on t attacking the case, or read three off uh, either conditionally or unconditionally. So what that generally looks like is a disad counterplan case arguments, maybe two disads case arguments, possibly two disads and a counterplan that's conditional, or maybe a disad counterplan uh, and a criticism, or possibly throw theory in there and place one of these things. I think that that gives you a decent amount of strategic flexibility without running the risk of spreading yourself too thin. I rarely see teams that can execute five or six off and probably effectively just because you can't go as fast in this event without reading cards uh, and you know judges can't read along with you. So it kind of limits uh, the amount of positions that you can read or at least develop well. I've seen teams go seven off and all seven off are terrible and they collapse to one of them in the block and the position is just so flimsy that it makes it easy for the PMR to sort of make almost new answers because they have to develop the argument so much more. So I, I caution you against trying to spread yourself too thin. I think two or three off that are well-developed, assuming you're also engaging with the affirmative effectively, which is incredibly important, is a good strategy, particularly for younger teams. Uh, I think that prep for the LOC is the responsibility of both debaters. Uh, unless you know for sure what position you're going to go for in the block and want to write MO extensions, I think that both partners should be prepping positions for the LOC to read. Now, this is the opposite of what you've been told about the PMC, and that's probably true, because I think that the MG needs to prep for first-line responses against the LOC, which means that the PMC should do all of their prep simultaneously. But the beautiful thing about the LOC is, and also the chaotic thing about it, is that you don't know what the PM is going to say, so the more things you have prepped, the better able you are to adapt to an unpredictable PMC strategy. So the more positions that you can get written as a partnership during the LOC prep, the better off you are. 
And I think that sometimes, uh, and I think someone already made this suggestion, uh, it is helpful to prep something that maybe you are not as familiar with. For example, uh, I read election politics basically every negative round for the first semester of my senior year. So uh, by the second tournament, I could give the election politics shell off the top of my head. At which point, my partner started writing a really bare bones version of that. Whereas I would write arguments that maybe I was less familiar with. Like if we were reading a criticism that maybe I didn't know as well, I would want to make sure that I understood the warrants of that uh, because I was going to be the one that had to explain it. So I think it can be helpful to sometimes write the arguments that you are not as well versed in, just so you have a better understanding. Uh, I also think that a lot of the preparation for the LOC starts well before the tournament starts. I think a good LOC is a well-read LOC. Uh, what I mean by that is you should have a wide knowledge about the things going on in the world, so you should at least know something about what the PMC might talk about. This is obviously easier said than done, but the more general knowledge you can have about the world and about global events, the better prepared you are. Uh, going off of that, I think that the best advice I can give to an LOC, and I think the best LOCs that I've seen in Parley Debate are the ones that have the ability to memorize and internalize arguments. It's incredibly important. You should always be able to memorize your favorite answers to impacts that you hear consistently. There's only a few impacts that you generally hear coming out of the affirmative. You'll hear global warming, economic collapse, uh, nuclear war, and some form of dehumanization, right? You should always have certain answers they can be impact defense against all of these things. Or if they're saying hegemony is good, you should always have the ability to say hegemony is bad at a moment's notice. These are arguments that as an LOC you should just have memorized because the less you have to think about it, the easier it is for you to try to adapt the strategies that maybe you weren't predicting. It also means that if you suspect, hey, I think this affirmative is probably going to have a hedge and an econ advantage, you don't have to spend time writing out case answers in the LOC prep. Instead, you can spend time writing another dissad or writing more links to the criticism. Uh, the more that you have internalized, the easier it is for you during prep time, and certainly the easier it is for you to adapt on the fly in the debate. Uh, I've mentioned the need to be able to be adaptable, uh, but that also means that I think you should have generic positions memorized that you like to be able to read. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes they're going to stand up and say something that you were not predicting. Sometimes they might stand up in the PMC, PMC and not talk about the resolution. That's going to happen sometimes. Uh, you should be able to get to the point eventually where you have certain generic positions memorized that you can read to answer this. For example, I think that you should always have a generic politics disad memorized. Uh, at least one. And have the ability to read it and tailor it to basically any affirmative that uh, deals with U.S. domestic politics. You should always be able to have that in your back pocket and see when it applies and use it as sort of a breaking case of emergency strategy. Uh, additionally, I think that having a good criticism or two that you just have memorized is always good because a good cap K can basically answer anything except in some instances a cap K on the AF, right? Cap will link to basically any affirmative and cap will link to basically any criticism. Uh, sometimes, even if they say cap out of the PMC, you can still criticize the way that they engage with that system out of the LOC. So, having a criticism memorized can always be a breaking case of emergency strategy that you can use in basically any circumstance, uh, regardless of what the PMC says. And the better you have that memorized, the easier it is for you to focus on how you're going to answer the uh, affirmative's case, and focus less on how you're going to desperately try to write down your positions and prep. Uh, I also think that having a good framework shell is important for answering the criticism if that's the way that you want to try to engage that. Uh, that's not the way that some teams like to engage the criticism, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but if you're a team that generally wants to read some sort of uh, procedural objection to a critical AF, then certainly having one of those shells memorized will make your job a lot easier. Uh, I think that the best LOCs are strategic, flexible, and dynamic, which means that they can take the strategy that they came up with in prep time and then tailor that to answer the affirmative most, uh, most effectively. That means sometimes the affirmative plan text is not going to be quite what you think it is, so sometimes that means you have to change the links to your dissat a little bit. And this is a criticism that I give a lot of LOCs, uh, particularly younger LOCs very frequently, which is that they become too wedded to exactly the wording that was, con like, uh, that was established during prep time. And I think that it's very easy to just kind of fall into that trap and assume that, hey, my coaches are smart, they gave us these links, these links are going to work no matter what. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And you need to be willing as the LOC to make small adjustments to your shell in order to make it more effectively answer the PMC. So don't be afraid to change the way that your positions are structured or even change what positions you're going to read if you think it is beneficial. 
if you get caught off guard by a PMC, and that will happen, uh, I think there are a few questions that you should ask yourself before determining whether or not you want to stick to your original strategy or uh, call an audible and read something else. The first question is, how much, if any, of the arguments I prepped can I use to answer this affirmative? Sometimes the answer is, I can make small, minor adjustments to the things we have prepped and still make it work. Other times the answer is, none of this stuff is going to apply, they've had a completely different take on the resolution, or they've determined that it's more important to talk about X issue, and so they've not read anything that my position will engage with. Uh, I think you also should ask, which of my generic positions that I have memorized will best answer this position? I have two criticisms memorized. Uh, I also have the ability to attack this using politics, and maybe I can make an econ shell up off on the fly. Which of these strategies is the best way to answer this affirmative? Sometimes, I think people fall back on the strategy that they're most comfortable with. If they've read CAP the most times, then they just read CAP. But I think that sometimes it's beneficial to determine not which you're most comfortable with, but which is the most strategic in a particular instance and go with that. So don't just fall into the trap of reading the thing that you always default back to, because what smart affirmatives will do will make a note of that and they'll say, okay, if I do something unpredictable, this kid always just reads CAP out of the LFC. So I'm really good at answering CAP. I'm going to do something unpredictable, bait them into reading capitalism, and then just tee off on it for eight minutes in the MG. So come up with different ways to answer unpredictable strategies. Don't just be uh, kind of beholden to one single argument. I think another question that you should ask is, is this case topical or theoretically legitimate? Uh, if you don't consider uh, that the government, if you didn't consider that the government team could read their affirmative, there's a chance that the reason you didn't consider it in prep time is because they're not topical, right? So don't be afraid to call them out if you think that their case is marginally topical, at least that gives you the strategic option if you're kind of reeling and looking for offense. Uh, and the fourth question is, how can I deal with the affirmative's impacts? Uh, because you don't only need to read off-case positions, but you also have to make sure that you're heavily engaging with the affirmative's case. Uh, can I read defense against their impacts? Does the affirmative actually solve what they say they solve? Uh, is there a counter plan I can read that would capture some of the PMC's impacts while avoiding the disadvantages? These are the questions that you should be asking yourself if they're reading a PMC that is unpredictable and making sure that you don't just come up with an off-case strategy, but that you also make sure to engage with an on-case. Because likely if they're reading a, a generic criticism on the affirmative, it's probably one that they're pretty comfortable with. So make sure that they don't get too comfortable in allowing them to just have eight minutes to answer what you come up with, but also make them defend their argument. Uh, there's a few specific things I have for case debate with the LOC that I want to mention briefly. Uh, the first has kind of been a long-running joke in the Parley community, which is to make the squo work for you. Uh, basically what that means is don't be afraid to say that uh, the things are fine right now. Do you see extinction going on right now? Uh, I don't, which means that probably the status quo is better than it could be, right? I think that there is a benefit to reading some status quo solves arguments that could answer both advantages. Uh, for example, if they are passing a policy that deals with environmental protection, and you happen to know about a Supreme Court case that recently dealt with this, and maybe changed the way that the states and the federal government have to interact with the environment, reading arguments that say that an upcoming or previously ruled on Supreme Court case uh, makes all of your app inevitable or makes it so the affirmative is redundant means that basically you can default to this argument as a de facto counter plan, right? Uh, this solves all the offense of the PMC and with no risk of the disad because we don't have to change anything, right? So uh, that's a good strategy that you can use because unlike a counter plan, which one, you might have to kick out of, two, you might have to read unconditionally, you can read as many status quo solves arguments as you want and you can read them in about 10 seconds apiece as opposed to a counter plan, which generally takes more time to develop. So if you are really effective at reading Squo solves arguments, that could be a really good strategy for dealing with the affirmative offense. Uh, also, this has been mentioned a lot, but it bears mentioning again, Disad turns case, that argument has to be made at some point in the debate. I think it's good to make it in the LOC because then no one can call it out for being new in the block, uh, but certainly if you make it in the LOC and the MG doesn't answer it, they're gonna be in some trouble. Uh, I also think, and this is sort of a personal preference, other people might disagree, that you can sometimes read a disad as a case argument. For example, if the affirmative has a hedge good advantage and you have a hedge bad disad, why make that debate happen on two sheets of paper if you don't have to? Some judges think that's confusing and that it muddles the debate too much, but I think it could be a good strategy to consolidate the debate and make the block easier for you. Also, in my experience, 
if you read like a really long case turn, I think the teams in the MG will be more likely to undercover that case turn than they would if you read it as an off-case position. Because they think, oh, it's just another case argument. I need to move on to the important things, which are the off-case. Which means that they're basically taking what would be a disad that you would have gone for anyway and undercovering it because they think it's less important. So that's a strategy that you can use as well. Uh, we'll I'll open it up for questions on the LLC after I'm done, but I do want to move on to the LOR. Uh, and the reason why I want to focus a lot on the LOR is because I think it is the most underutilized and uh, most frequently misused speech in debate. Uh, very frequently, I think that the LOR just kind of stands up and says what the MO said originally, but says it prettier. Which is fine, I guess, if you're beginning and just kind of figuring out what's happening in the debate. Sometimes you say that for your benefit as much as for the judge's benefit. I think that if you're doing the LOR correctly, the LOR should never repeat the MO. And that's incredibly important. Uh, you will be told that the LOR cannot make new arguments. You are being lied to. The LOR can and should be making new arguments, but they have to be arguments that are based on the subtext of the debate. They're arguments that may not have been made explicitly, but they have certainly been made implicitly if the LOC and the MO are doing their job. The LOR arguments extrapolate on the implications of what uh, the LOC and the MO have said. For example, a disad turns case argument can be blown up in the LOR under the guise of weighing impacts, which is one of the primary jobs of that speech. The job of the LOR is to weigh impacts, determine why your impacts are more important than theirs, and to preempt and predict what the PMR is going to say and get ahead of them. If you can do those two things effectively, you can win a lot of debates. The reason why the LOR is so dangerous is because the PMR is not listening to you. This is almost universal, and I found this as an LOR very frequently. Uh, the PMR is not listening to what you're saying. They are prepping for their speech. They think that the MO has said all that there is to say, and that the LOR is basically four minutes of prep time. If they think that, they are putting themselves at a huge disadvantage, because if you are using the LOR effectively and making new arguments, or at least uh, contextualizing MO arguments in new and unique ways, then you are making arguments that the PMR does not know exist. But the person who does know that they exist is the judge, who is listening to this and likely thinking, that I'm listening to an LOR that for the first time in many rounds is saying something of value. So they're probably paying a particular amount of attention if you're doing a good job in the LOR. So your opponent isn't listening to you, but the judge is. What's up, Kelly? Um, for being the PMR, would you recommend that your partner listens to the LOR? Uh, yeah, 100%. That's, that yeah, that's, that's always what I would do as an MG, is I would make sure that the LOR wasn't doing anything slimy. Uh, it would be my job to call point of orders and at least let my partner know if the LOR is contextualizing or weighing impacts in a way that I don't think he would have predicted. So certainly I think that that should be the job of the MG. Uh, I don't know what else your job would be because you're done talking, so you might as well make yourself useful in some way. Uh, I think that one thing you should do uh, at the beginning of the LOR is a float overview. A lot of people will say there's an overview, you can put it anywhere. Uh, I think that you should make the judge write down what you have to say because if you're going to say it, it should be important. Uh, I think that there's two ways that overviews have been done really effectively in the LOR. You might have your own personal preference, and that's fine, but these are the ones that I think I've seen used really well. Uh, the first one is to say, your ballot will read, UT Tyler wins the debate because of X. Literally write the judge's ballot for them. Tell them exactly the argument that they're going to start off their RFD with. If the PMR is cluttered or confusing, that one single moment of clarity in the LOR can't help the judge make a good decision. Another good way to do it, uh, which is my personal preference, is there are three reasons why the opposition from UT Tyler is winning this debate. One, two, three. Those would generally look like, one, they don't get their impacts, or if we're reading a counterpoint, we get their impacts too. Two, the disad turns the case and has an exterior impact that's probably bigger and more important than theirs. And three, we are winning this debate based on impact count. Now, focusing on the last part of that, I think there are three words that should be the best friends of any LOR. And those words are probability, time frame, and magnitude. You should familiarize yourself with these words and use them as much as possible. Uh, they are ways you can separate yourself from the PMR. The PMR has to answer the MO's line by line and the LOR's impact count. Normally, PMRs prioritize the first aspect and uh, make sure that they're not getting beat on the flow. But if you've done good impact count, it can mean that even if the PMR might be slightly ahead on a few arguments, if they haven't weighed these arguments effectively, they're still at a disadvantage. 
Uh, this seems like a good time to talk about why uh, Impact Hub can be important and to talk about uh, the ways that you can do it effectively. There's a few arguments I think that you can use to make time frame a particularly devastating weapon. I think it's one of the most underutilized arguments by the LOR, but the best LORs that I've seen are the ones that can make time frame arguments really effectively. Uh, the first is I think that a lot of time frame arguments haven't been made in this debate prior. Uh, it's likely that the LOC, PMC, uh, and probably even the MG and the ML haven't really talked about the time frame in which the impacts happen. But I think judges are willing to let the LOR get away with murder on this question. If, for example, you are reading a relation to this ad which says that a change in U.S. policy to, say, uh, Japan, for example, would cause Japan to immediately start rearming and maybe their advantage is to resolve global warming down the road, right? Uh, no one has talked about when these impacts happen, but I think the LOR is a good time for that. You say in the LOR that our argument from the beginning is that there is an immediate change in perception in a world where the plant happens. That means that Japan immediately starts to nuclearize. That means that China immediately becomes concerned about this. All of this happens the second that the affirmative comes into effect. So we have an instant time frame. Even if the impact is down the road, uh, the chain of internal links that lead to the impact becomes instantaneous and becomes irreversible the second that the affirmative happens. Conceded arguments likely. Their impact is global warming, which probably won't happen for a long time. And if they haven't given a definite time frame for global warming, you can say they don't even tell you how long global warming is going to happen. So the fact that they haven't made an immediacy claim likely means that it is generations down the road. Uh, and time frame is important for a couple reasons. The first is that an impact that happens first shifts the uniqueness of all the other impacts in the debate. What I mean by that is it is impossible to predict what would happen to global warming in a world where a nuclear war happens tomorrow, right? All of their projections about the environment and what that's going to look like are irrelevant if our event, which is a nuclear holocaust, changes all of their projections, right? It's likely that the environment would probably be in a not a great shape in a world of that. So you would functionally have to make new uniqueness arguments for them as a judge to give them any credence on what their scenario would look like. Uh, also, I think that you should be able to say that it doesn't matter what might happen if global warming kills us all in 2030 if we are dead tomorrow, right? You should prioritize staying alive longer because at least there is a chance that maybe something down the road could help address global warming, but you know for a fact that if you vote affirmative, we're all dead from a nuclear war tomorrow. There's nothing that can change that because the time frame is too quick. There is not time for any other, in, any other variables to intervene in this situation. So time frame arguments can be really important. Probability is also a really uh, good argument to make. Uh, I think that you can say that there's always a 0.001% chance that basically anything could cause extinction, right? There is a mathematical chance that me giving this lecture today is doing the entire world to extinction. It's not probable, but technically it's, you know, possible. Uh, but I think it would be irrational to say that you should prioritize that slim chance of a big stick impact as opposed to avoiding something that you know is or will happen down the road. Uh, because that decision calculus would cause policy stagnation. Because there's basically a chance that anything you do could cause an extinction level event. Which means if you're constantly afraid of doing that, you would never do anything. And systemic or probable impacts become inevitable, right? I think that you can use that type of logic and type of framing to make probability a real weapon for you. Uh, additionally, I think that uh, magnitude is obviously very important. I think that that's the thing that teams normally use, so I'll talk a little bit less about that. But uh, not prioritizing magnitude would justify uh, doing something like saving a cat that you know is stuck in a tree right now. You know, you know it's there, so it's the most probable, and it's up there right now, so it's the best time frame. Uh, as opposed to doing something like addressing the long-term collapse of Social Security, which is going to happen in a few years, uh, but it's certainly bigger, and maybe won't happen. But if it does happen, that cat's going to be the least of your worries, right? That type of logic would justify always dealing with the problem that's immediately in front of you right now, as opposed to worry about the problem that's going to be bigger down the road. So that type of logic is not good. Uh, but also the, the phrase that gets used a lot is uh, 0 0.001 times infinity is still infinity, which is basically just a weird uh, pseudo-math way of saying that an impact that is existential is so important that any risk that that happens means that you have to act to avoid it, right? Because there's no coming back from an impact that is going to kill everyone. So that type of impact calculus, I think, can be really helpful in the LOR. And again, uh, you normally hear about 15 seconds of impact calc in the PMR, if the PMR even feels up to that. Uh, if the LOR is two, three minutes of that type of impact calc, you're at a massive advantage over them because they will not be able to answer it.
Or if they do, they're probably just going to undercover what the MO said, and you've got an advantage there anyway. I think that the only time that the LOR should be explaining the entire story of, say, a diss ad they're going for is if the MO was really, really, really fast, or if the debate has gotten muddled. I think the only times where the LOR should focus only on explaining what was said in the previous speech is if your partner has just, you know, kind of been all over the place. Maybe the MG was confusing. Maybe the debate just got really clustered. Sometimes it is beneficial to then give a global overview on a position and say, let's go to the diss ad. The overview on the diss ad is, here's what they said our story is. They're inaccurate. Here's what our story actually is. They didn't answer it. Something like that could be helpful. But certainly don't feel the need to repeat the MO or to basically just kind of tell the story of the debate. Uh, that is a role of the LOR, but that is not the only role of the LOR. And do not get uh, trapped into just relying on that too much. Uh, as I said, the other job of the LOR is to predict the strategy of the PMR and block it out. That's a thing that is a lot easier said than done. And it certainly becomes a lot easier the more that you debate. So it's not something that you can instantly just kind of step in and follow these three tricks and you'll be able to do it right. It's a thing that you get over uh, repetition and doing round after round after round and seeing all the PMRs that you can. Uh, I think the question that you should be asking yourself though is, if I were the PMR, what would I be doing here? Or if you're an MG and you can't really put yourself in the position of the PMR, if I had just given that MG, what arguments would I be desperately telling the PMR to go for? If you can consider what those strategies are going to be, it can make it much easier for you to get out ahead of it. And the way that you can do that is by making arguments that preempt them. For example, say that you have read a politics this ad and you think that it's likely that the PMR is going to try to go for a link term. You can say things like, even if you buy their terrible link term, even if they win this argument in the PMR that they're probably going to go for, which was bad to begin with, our other arguments outweigh. It is more important that this link argument is intact than it is that their link turn is intact, right? You can say that I know what they're going to go for in the PMR, but it is irrelevant and unimportant because what we've said is a far bigger issue in the debate. Now, sometimes you'll win these arguments, sometimes you'll lose them. But in my experience, just being able to say, uh, I know what the PMR is going to go for, and then in two or three minutes you end up being right, makes it look like the LOR was just on their game. It makes it look like the LOR has seen what the debate is going to play out and that the LOR is in control of what's happening. That makes it much more likely that the judge is going to instinctively just default to other things that the LOR might be right about. If they were right about what the PMR is going to go for, that probably means that they are two or three steps ahead of the PMR, which means that they probably outflank them on all these other issues. I think it perceptually puts you in a much better position, but also strategically, it lets you make arguments that preempt what the PMR is going to say. And again, arguments that the PMR probably isn't listening to, so very well might not answer. Uh, I also think, and some people might disagree with me on this, but I think they're wrong. Uh, I think that you can get away with shadow extending arguments from the LOC to answer arguments that the MO did not cover well. Sometimes the MO is going to drop something, or maybe they'll answer it in a way that is not complete, uh, but maybe they just have to move on because they have a lot to cover. In that world, I think you can say, look at this warrant from the LOC shell that was never answered by the MG. The MO may not have explicitly answered this argument, but this argument has been in the debate the whole time, so I'm going to extend this argument from the LO that was never answered and apply it here. I don't think you say that. Like, you don't actually say, this argument wasn't in the MO. Uh, but I think you just kind of make that argument and say, uh, they will stand up and go for this link turn, but they have conceded from the LOC this preempt that intuitively answers this argument. Or they have conceded this uniqueness warrant, which was never answered, it's not in the MG, that answers this link turn intuitively. I think that making shadow extensions like that can be a good way to make it look like, even if the MO uh, did sort of undercover or drop an argument, that maybe one, wasn't that big of a deal, or two, maybe the MO did it on purpose because they knew that the argument had already been conceded from the LOC. What's up, Catherine? Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's, that's a good way that I think you can get out of it. Uh, sometimes, on the off chance that your opponent is really listening to what you say, they will point of order it, in which case I think that if you can say, look, this was my number two uniqueness argument in the LOC, I am extending it, it is in the MO, because they are extending the uniqueness, presumably. Uh, it is in the debate, you can find it in the LOC flow, they have not answered it in the MG, I have the ability to weigh that against an argument that came out. I think that most judges let you get away with that, at least they did in my experience. Uh, certainly, I don't think you lose anything by trying, particularly if the argument that your uh, partner has conceded might be important. 
Uh, I also think that the LOR can point out a lack of sophistication in their arguments. For example, I always think that the LOR should be a little bit sassy, like there should be a little bit of edge to it. Not that you should be mean, but anytime you can kind of subtly make fun of the opponents or make their arguments look dumb, you should take that opportunity. Like, you should preference our hyper-specific link story, our incredibly well-warranted link, over their super generic link defense that they read to any politics to set, right? Frame their arguments as incredibly generic and just tags, as opposed to the warranted, incredibly detailed, nuanced analysis that you wonderfully crafted in your LOC, right? Framing their arguments rhetorically like that, I think, has an effect on the way that the judge perceives it, and frequently, I think that the LOC should have better warrants on their link level than the MG does in answering it. So a lot of times that LOR characterization is just accurate. Uh, this is another thing that is a preference for me and maybe not for everyone, uh, but I think that the LOR should be slower than most speeches. One, I don't think you have as much to do, so you probably don't have the time constraints. Uh, but two, and I think this is often overlooked, which is that the debate is still fundamentally a communicative event. Uh, and more than any speech, the LOR is ripe with opportunities to really persuade people. Now, I don't mean fill it with flowery language and tell you know, a moving story about the children that will be killed if you vote for the affirmative plan, but I do mean that let the MO be as fast and technical as they want, and let the LOR tell a very clear story about what happens in a world of the affirmative compared to what happens in a world of the negative. The PMR, if the PMR is you know, having to answer a pretty good MO, it's going to have a lot of things to cover. You have to cover eight minutes of content in five minutes, right? So they're going to be stressed and strapped for time anyway. So you get a chance to be really clear where the PMR might have to just kind of briefly talk about something at top speed and then move on, right? You get a chance to really make a point stick in the LOR, and that's an opportunity that rarely happens in the world of the affirmative. So I would uh, be remiss if I didn't tell you to take advantage of it. What's up, Zach? Going slow in the LOR also puts a lot of pressure on the PMR, because the slower you go, the faster they will try and go, because mm -hmm. they, they, they feel nervous about it, they yeah. worry that there's something that they've missed, and they will purposefully try to go faster, and as a result, they will undercover our students, and like, either explain that they want to move while going to the speed of the glasses, cover the dingus, are able to spread that out. Yeah, I think that's very true. Uh, the one last thing I will add, uh, and this is something that's kind of separate from a lot of the other things I've talked about the LOR, but I think it's important, is that I don't think you really have to go back and discuss positions that you have already kicked under basically any circumstance. Uh, if, for example, you read two dissads and a counterplan, you kick one of those dissads and go for the other dissad and the counterplan, I don't think you have to go back and talk about the dissad that you've already jettisoned at all. The only scenario in which you think you have to do that would be one, if you don't think the MO did a good job of cleanly kicking it, in which case you probably should tell them before they move on to pick it cleanly. Uh, but if you think that they've you know, maybe left some offense or maybe there's a way for them to resurrect it, then I think you should do that. Uh, or two, if you think that they're so far behind in the debate they'll have to try to resurrect this dissad, maybe you mention it briefly. Uh, but I see a lot of younger LOCs talk about every sheet of paper that's in the debate, which I think is a bad strategy. You should only talk about the sheets of paper in the LOR that matter, and especially the ones that matter to you. So spend more time talking about your offense, the reasons why you have won the debate in the LOR, as opposed to reasons why the affirmative is lost. So to summarize, preempt and predict, weigh impacts, and make sure that your narrative is clearer than theirs. Write the ballot for the judge in the LOR, and you will win a shocking number of negative debates because the PMR is not listening to you, but the judge certainly is. So that's all I have to say about the LOR, uh, but I will open it up now to any questions about either of those speeches. Yeah? I just have uh, one note on something that Matt mentioned earlier when he was talking about uh, impact calculus and like, how the three aspects of it. There is like a four kind of like cousin to these, uh, to these primary three, which is reversibility ability for an impact to be like flipped over after the fact. So that's just like another angle you should be aware of when you get like LOR or impact calculus. Yeah, extinction is an irreversible impact, but like humanization, maybe not. So those are the kind of things you need to think about like the way you are doing your impact calculus to LOR. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, earlier in the LOC you were talking about making the status quo for a few Uh, I, th I think the arguments are much more effective when you can say it's like, imminently going to be implemented or passed. 
Uh, um, it, these arguments can still work if you can make another warrant as to why it's inevitable that even if it's been tabled right now, it's going to pass at some point because of X, Y, and Z. If you can make those warrants, and they can still be effective. Uh, I think it's, these arguments are more effective when you're able to read them quickly. So if you don't have to go into a lot of procedural explanation about how uh, it will get passed down the road eventually, then it probably puts you at a bigger advantage. But that's not to say that if you have a great argument about a bill that's in Congress that you know will 100% solve all of their affirmative, you could make it as a SAS bill argument. Uh, though in that world, you also could just read that bill as a counter plan uh, if that bill particularly avoided the disadvantages. Uh, it might be more strategic in a world where you can't make uh, a claim about the inevitability of the slope solving, that just you read that bill as a counter plan, say that solves all the impacts of the uh, of the PMC and avoids the links to the dis side. I think it would be more strategic to do it that way, but again, it's kind of up to the LSE's discretion. <coughs> Anything else? I realized I had to go kind of quickly through that lecture just because I had two speeches to cover. So if after lunch you've digested uh, these things and thought of any more questions, then certainly feel free to approach me if we can talk about it later. Cool. Yeah.